Today on Brainways, we welcome uh, Dr. Katie McLaughlin, PhD. She's an assistant professor of psychology at University of Washington and director of its Stress and Development Lab. And she's also the winner of the 2015 IMRO AIM Rising Star Award. And this award is a $250,000 award sponsored by EMRO's chapter, AIM. And uh, we thank AIM and its donors for their uh, generous contributions to enable us to give her this award. And the purpose of the award is to enable uh, the uh, meaningful discoveries uh, to better understand uh, the development of depression and anxiety in youth. And the other purpose of the award is to help a promising young scientist take their career to a new level of efficacy for uh, in the brain health research community. And uh, Katie McLaughlin, you are it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I am deeply grateful uh, to be the recipient of this award and am very excited to be working with the foundation on this exciting new project. Fantastic. And thank you for appearing on Brainwave to talk about your research. I really appreciate you doing this. My pleasure. So, great. So let's dive right in. So um, you've worked in this field of, uh, of understanding uh, depression and anxiety and other symptoms in youth uh, for a while. Why is understanding the, the neural mechanisms, the biology behind how stress can cause depression and anxiety in youth such an important topic for people to research and, and you to research right now? You know, one of the most robust and consistent findings um, in the entire literature on mental health and the determinants of mental health problems is that environmental experience plays an enormous role in determining who ends up developing a mental health problem. And we see that exposure to stress, exposure to adversity um, is among the most powerful predictors uh, of anxiety and depression, as well as other types of mental health problems, not only in kids, but across the life course. And so it begs the question of, of why. And that's really the key question that we'll be examining um, in this project. Um, and now in terms of the brain science, um, when we think about mechanisms that might link the environment to risk for mental health problems, you know, the brain is really the first place we want to look, right? Because it's ultimately the, me the mechanism that connects our social experiences and our experiences in the world with um, our emotions, our cognitions, and our behavior. Um, and by using, you know, advances in human neuroscience tools, we're able to um, identify mechanisms in a much more specific way than we can with other measures. Um, and we hope that by understanding these mechanisms, we'll be able to develop innovative uh, new intervention approaches, um, not only to prevent the onset of anxiety and depression in children, um, but to better learn how to treat these conditions. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's a fantastic research proposal that you're describing. Uh, what specifically new innovative uh, research tools do you plan to bring to bear to, to get, the, get these discoveries you're hoping to get? So the proposal really involves two um, particularly new innovations. Um, the first um, really involves sort of the timing with which we're trying to study the process of how stress ultimately changes our thoughts and feelings and behaviors in ways that might increase risk for psychopathology like anxiety and depression. So what we're proposing is to bring um, teenagers into the lab much more frequently than is common. So um, kids will be coming in once a month. We'll be learning about the things that happened to them over the past month, and we'll be doing short um, brain scans every month so that we can start to sort of um, un piece together how these changes happen in a dynamic and unfolding way after experiences of stress and adversity. Um, so that's the first innovation. And the second innovation is that, you know, even bringing people in once a month um, is a relatively crude timescale in some ways. Um, and there have been remarkable advances in our ability to monitor many, many aspects of people's behavior um, based on smartphone technology, which almost everybody has these days, and teenagers in particular. Um, and so teenagers are really wired up. And we can learn an enormous amount about their behavior passively um, through their uh, use of smartphone technology without having to bother them at all. And we can learn learn um, how many steps they've taken in a day, how much they slept, and what the quality of that sleep was, how much they're interacting with their peers over social media or through phone calls and text, um, how much screen time they're using. Um, this enormous amount of information that is highly relevant to understanding how stress may be impacting emotions, behavior, particularly social behavior, sleep, um, and even physiology. So with Fitbits and other types of uh, devices, 
we can now um, learn about changes in heart rate and heart rate variability and skin conductance and other physiological indicators that we know are relevant to emotion and to depression and anxiety um, that can all be collected passively without burden to the subjects who are participating in the research, which is a remarkable kind of advance in our ability to learn about these dynamic changes over time. So um, in what ways, uh, well, according to our hypotheses, uh, what findings do you predict you might uh, discover at each stage of your project? So the first thing that we are proposing, and this is really related to the brain, um, the brain scanning piece or the neuroimaging piece of the project, is that exposure to stress um, makes other negative cues in your environment more salient, right? So it um, influences regions of the brain that sort of identify salient cues in the environment. And it makes cues that are potentially negative or threatening more salient to you. So it makes you have stronger emotional reactions to other negative things that happen. And you can sort of relate to this, right? Something stressful happens in your day, you come home and some minor hassle occurs and it makes you much more upset or um, angry than it would have had you not experienced that stressor earlier in the day. So there's kind of this sensitization to negative cues in the environment. Um, we hypothesize that that's true, but we actually don't really know. We certainly don't know based on brain science. So that's one hypothesis that we'll be, we'll be examining. The second is that stress, um, stress might make positive cues in the environment or things that we normally find rewarding um, to be less positive or less rewarding. So in that same stressful day, you know, you might come home and do an activity you normally enjoy, you know, take a long walk or go to the gym and find it just to be, you know, not as pleasant as it normally is. Maybe it feels like a chore instead of something positive in your day. You know, in addition, we think that stress might lead to changes in social behavior. So for example, a teenager experiences something stressful, they may feel less motivated to reach out to their friends to, um, to talk about it or to engage in the kinds of social activities that might distract them from the negative emotional effects of that stressor. We'll be able to learn that by monitoring the amount of texting and phone calls that teenagers are engaging in um, on days when they experience stressors versus not, um, for example. We're also interested in how you know, stress might impact the, um, the way the ways in which different parts of the brain interact with each other and communicate with each other. Um, and we think, for example, that stress might influence the coupling of these regions so that, you know, after a stressful event, um, although you might normally be able to modulate that angry response you have to a minor hassle that happens later in your day, it might be much harder for you to do that, to kind of get yourself back on track, to distract yourself or um, engage in behaviors that might help to modulate the intensity of that emotional response. Um, and that really reflects like a coupling between emotional centers of the brain, like the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, which is the control region in the brain. I can I can empathize with uh, the kind of things you're describing. Like uh, when I get stressed out, I find that my my empathy kind of goes out the window, and I'm very much <laughs> less patient with people. Uh, you know, I prefer not to get stressed <laughs> for that reason and other yep. reasons. But uh, but yeah, and you're going to find out that the brain, uh, the actual brain mechanisms that that modulate, that mediate that that process. So that's very exciting. Exactly. Hope, uh, and we yeah. think, you know, that the, the more we understand these processes, the better able we are to really unpack these mechanisms, the better we'll be able to target our interventions at the right mechanism, right? So if we're going to try to prevent the onset of anxiety and depression in kids or better treat them, we need to really understand sort of what's been disrupted or what has gone wrong. And so that's really the goal of the study is to really dig into these mechanisms so that we can um, have better targets for our interventions. That's great. That's great. Well, um, I, I really am impressed with uh, the proposal that you've, uh, you've you put forward and, and your, your description of it right now. Um, so uh, thank you for appearing on Brainwaves to talk about this. If, user, if uh, viewers on IMRO's website, when I post this video on October 28, 2015, have any questions for you um, mm -hmm. online, are you ready to answer some questions for them? I'd be happy to. Great. Thank you, Katie. And viewers, thank you for watching. Please tune in to imro.org slash brain dash waves uh, on October 28th through 30th on 2015 uh, to ask Katie your, your follow-up questions. So thanks, everybody, and take care.